Richard Smith, Jr., pastor of New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, 2186 Hawkins Mill Road in Memphis, Tennessee. We're near the intersection of Hawkins Mill and Overton Crossing. Uh, New Salem is a growing church for growing people, going all out for God. Uh, we invite you to celebrate with us in worship and in Bible study. Uh, our worship services are on Sundays at 11 o'clock for approximately one hour. Uh, we also stream on Facebook and YouTube at the 11 o'clock hour. Um, our Bible study, as you can see now, is on Thursdays at 12 o'clock. And we thank you for joining us uh, at this point in time. Again, we are open, but again, we ask you to use your own discretion, your own judgment as it relates to coming out, uh, being in a gathering. Uh, we do practice social distancing. We follow all CDC guidelines uh, relative to face masks. Uh, and taking temperatures. We try to make sure that we, is, we are as fully compliant as possible. But again, if we find that we need to add additional services to accommodate people in a safe manner, we will do so. But again, we invite you to fellowship with us in worship and in spirit uh, at New Salem Missionary Baptist Church, Frazier. Um, God bless you, and we thank you for taking your time out of your busy day join us at this lunch hour. It is a beautiful day. This is another day that the Lord hath made, and we are most definitely rejoicing and glad in it. The weather is beautiful, uh, and our God is great. Amen. We thank you. Um, we are here to study a beautiful lesson, a wonderful lesson, and based on the nature of this lesson, I'm sure that most of you all have already received some great teaching, uh, and if you have not already received some great teaching, I am most certainly that uh, whomever you sit under for regular Bible study uh, will provide you with some excellent teaching as it relates to this, this, this letter of love. Amen. This letter of love. Uh, we're dealing with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 13. I apologize. Those who have my notes, the notes are on my Facebook page uh, and on the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church Facebook page. But again, the scripture is 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, uh, affectionately called the love chapter, uh, where Paul so eloquently uh, expounds on this thing that we know be love, the preeminent Christian motive, uh, the, 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 the motion behind everything in action and reason behind everything that God had, has done for man. And it should be the motive behind everything that we do for one another, uh, which makes love the preeminent Christian motive. We're looking at the lesson for October 25th, 2020. Again, it's on my Facebook page and the New Salem Facebook page. We're in the fall quarter dealing with love for one another. This is the last lesson in this unit dealing with inclusive love. We love look at loving our enemies. We look, look at loving our neighbors. Uh, now we're looking at uh, this love that never fails. We're getting a greater insight uh, as it relates to this thing uh, known as love. Uh, remember the love, godly love we deal with is not an emotion. But godly love is a constant decision to do right uh, because of who God is. Because of who God is first. And because you belong to him second, and because God loves all third. Amen. Which means God love, agape must move in all directions at the same time. It's first love for God, uh, then second love for yourself as a child of God, and then third love for other men uh, as we invite them to become children of God. Uh, this lesson, uh, love that never fails, love that never fails. Everything comes and goes, uh, especially in this life, but love never fails. Watch this. Love never fails and then it never even changes. Uh, we, uh, even though we will live forever, uh, everlasting life starts the moment you receive Christ your personal Savior because the record is you don't die, you sleep. So everlasting life begins in you once you receive Christ. Even our bodies will change. The dynamics of our existence will change, but love never changes. Love is the one thing that transitions the grave. Uh, godly love I'm talking about. Godly love is the same on this side of the grave as it is in glory on, on the back side. Now, let me distinguish this. In the Greek, there are uh, four, four words for love. Uh, remember, the English language is limited in its availability of words. And so uh, we took the older languages, which had more words, and we compacted it uh, into the English language, and we lost some clarity and definition. And so we use the term love to uh, mean many things. But uh, they were very specific. Uh, first of all, um, there is eros. 
Eros. Eros is the love that we feel for our significant other, uh, sexual or sensual love. Amen. It is a, an emotion. Amen. That's why people say they fall in the love and out of love because our emotions are unstable. Uh, then there's Storgi. Storgi is family love, the love that you feel for your mother, your father, your sisters, your brothers, your sons, and your daughters. Now watch this. The same love you feel for your children is a different love that you feel for your spouse. Amen. Because your children should not arouse you sensually, neither should your parents. Amen. So that love is called Storgi, which is family love. Then third, let's call a love called Philia. Uh, city of Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love because Philia uh, is a brotherly love. Uh, there's a love you feel for your significant other, a love you feel for your family. Then there's a love you feel for your friends, a general love, amen, that endears you uh, to those uh, that you may not be related to. Now, let me say, though, all these loves, all those, these are emotions, amen, which means they are unstable. They're, they, they ebb and flow in intensity. Uh, they wane, they come and they go, they move, they're moody, uh, and, and they are emotions. But when we come to agape, which is godly love, it's not based on a feeling, it's based on an action. It's based on your relationship with God as opposed to your relationship with man. But you, you, you relate to man based on your relationship with God. Now, agape love, as I said, is a decision to do right according to the word of God, regardless of what your emotions are saying. Regardless of how you feel, uh, it, it, it may be kind of similar to the love that makes a mother still love a child when the child has made her angry, or it may relate to a father's love to get up in the cold. He may be sick, and it may be the dead of winter, but he knows his family needs food, and he sacrifices himself, amen, in order to get up and go feed his family. That is agape. It's not based on a feeling. I can I cannot like you. Amen. But I can still agape you. And so we're looking at uh, this agape love is a love never fails. Again, since those first three emotions are based on um, first three loves are based on human emotion. Amen. And we are fallible human beings, which means we can fail. If those loves are based on us. then those loves to those love also can fail. But agape love is based on God. God never fails, so agape never fails. Now, where do those loves come from? Amen. Uh, agape love is the original love. The other loves are an extension of agape, but they have been warped by sin. They have been warped by humanity. They've been jaded. Uh, they've been colored uh, by our feelings and our emotion, our relationship. Amen. And that's what makes them unstable. So we take godly love and we impose our will and our emotions on it. And that's what makes the Philly of the story. Amen. And the uh, arrows. We take pure godly love and, and, and we modify it. Amen. To fit our human needs. We are in the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, again, which is affectionately called the love chapter. Um, Hebrews 10 is called, 11 is called the faith chapter. And this is called the love chapter. We, we affectionately title because this is Paul's doctrine. Amen. As it relates to help us understand what real love is all about. Uh, as we come to this lesson, we were coming from the book of First of, of Corinthians, which is a book written to the Corinthian church. Amen. Paul established the uh, church at Corinth on his second missionary journey. Amen. He stayed there sometime, 18 months, as I recall, uh, even though there was some opposition. Uh, but he did a great work there. Uh, Corinth is a Greek city, uh, which is diverse. Uh, it's influential. There are, there, there are a lot of movers and shakers, uh, and thinkers and blue collar workers. Uh, in the city of Corinth. Amen. So that it is diverse. Uh, and as such, the church is diverse. Remember, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God and salvation for all those that believe first to the Jew and then to the Gentile or the Greek. Amen. So now we've had others come to the church and it is diverse. They've come from everywhere from different backgrounds. and They have different perspectives uh, as it relates to things in life and as it re uh, fundamentally relates to things of church. And so after Paul has gone, uh, uh, when Paul leaves, uh, the church becomes influenced. Uh, and again, whenever a church is absent a leader, whenever there is no leader at a church, a church becomes influenced by all types of egos, attitudes, opinions, and things like that. Amen. So anytime you have a flock, amen, that does not have a shepherd, that's called a flock in danger. Amen. A flock 
without a shepherd is the flock in danger. And there are sheep that will try to assume the role of shepherd. Amen. But your desire to assume the role of shepherd is not make you a shepherd. And so anytime you have a flock, amen, without a shepherd, that is a flock in danger. And so uh, this church has been played with an abundance of pride rooted problems. And we find that even today, most of the problems that exist in the modern church are rooted and grounded in pride which is one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, and uh, most of this, this is centered around the use and misuse and misunderstanding of the purpose and nature of spiritual gifts. The purpose and nature of spiritual gifts. Amen. Uh, spiritual gifts are designed for the edification of Christ, for the edification of the body of Christ. And they are designed to glorify God. If you recall, even when Jesus raised Lazarus, Jesus said, uh, the miracles, the things that I do, I do that, that, that these people might believe and that God might be glorified. Uh, when Jesus hung dead and died on the cross, he looked to heaven and said, now, Father, I was come to thy glorify thy son as I glorify thyself. Again, everything has been done for the glory of God. It wasn't just done to show and it wasn't not done. It wasn't done for ego. Amen. Uh, that's why Jesus told Satan in the wilderness, the man should not live by bread alone. Satan, I don't use the power of God, even though it's at my disposal, simply to turn bread and stone into bread just to impress you, or simply to jump off of a cliff to prove who I am. I don't have to prove who I am as long as I am approved unto God. And so there is a massive misuse and misunderstanding of the purpose of spiritual gifts. Amen. Spiritual gift is not at the disposal of the person who is gifted. Did you get that? It's not at the random disposal of the person who's gifted. Amen. Because guess what? It's not available all the time. Uh, did you get what I said? Uh, your spiritual gift is not available at all time. Why? Because sometimes we're full of self instead of full of the spirit. Sometimes we got more of our own spirit than we do of his spirit. And then the all the time may not be the right time. So just because God gave you a, a, a healing spirit one day to lay a hand on somebody does not mean you can go open up a shop and start having healing services seven days a week. That's misunderstanding the purpose and the nature. And it's not to enrich you, it's to glorify him. It's not for people to, to magnify you, it's for people to magnify him. So your spiritual gift is not for you, you are a conduit. When it comes to spiritual gifts, you are set we. Let me say we are simply water hoses. We do not connect the water hose to a spigot to drink the water. We do not connect the water hose to the spigot to get the glory. Amen. The water hose is just a conduit to get the water from the spigot to, what, to wherever it needs to be. Amen, somebody. And a spiritual gift is God's way of getting his blessing, his ministry from his hands to the place that it needs to be. God bless you, somebody. That's the nature of a spiritual gift, not to make people brag on you, not to make yourself seem holy, not to make it look like you got to hook up, not to make people come and bow down to you. But your spiritual gift is all about him. Amen. Now, this book, so this book, Corinthians, First Corinthians, is written in, in response to what is going on in the church of Corinthians, Corinth, absence of the pastor. Now, again, when the pastor does not, church does not have a pastor. To teach systematic sound doctrine, all kind of stuff will come up in the church because everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an idea. Everybody's got an attitude. But the church is not grounded on your opinion, your attitude, or your thinking. It's grounded on the word of God. And so Paul is in Ephesus now on his third missionary journey. And he finds a need to stop Paul's, and he writes this letter to the church. And this letter is written to address the host of issues uh, that this church is dealing with, including issues of pride, arrogance, selfishness, uh, and then uh, in detail, spiritual gifts, amen, not being used in love, amen. So he's going back to redress, to, to, to reset them, uh, to, to, to restart them, to give them a jump start, a boost off, amen, in the doctrine of, of love and of, of, of understanding gifts so that they may get back on the right track. And again, uh, in this letter, uh, he begins to deal spe specifically from chapters 12 through 14, but in 13, uh, in the middle of it, he stops to, to 
to, to lay the rest, the entire issue. And Paul simply says this. He says, love will resolve all issues. He said, whatever issues are going on in the church, if you know how to love like God said love, no matter what's going on in your life and your emotions, no matter what's going on in your situation, your surrounding, uh, if we learn how to love like God said love, amen, that will resolve all the issues because love overcomes was a multitude of fault and it overcomes a multitude of things. And if we in America, even this day, would love each other like God said we are to love each other, we will find that many of the marches and the things we're having to do in this nation today would not even be necessary. Now, again, the love we're talking about is agape love. Our problem is that we don't deal with agape, we deal with the lower level loves, the emotional loves, such as uh, Eros, Storge, and Philia. Amen. Those are the loves that allows us to form cliques uh, and groups and gangs. Amen. But there is no gang in agape. Uh, there's only God in agape. Amen. There is no gang in agape. There's only God in agape. In every other form of love, there can be a gang. Amen. Because those other loves seek to separate. Notice I said you got Ilya, which is brotherly love. You got Storgi, which is family love. You got Eros, which is your significant other love. And so watch this. Those loves are limited. They're finite. They're pointed. They are directed toward a specific group. Amen. So it, it, so when you deal with Eros, if, if, if I'm not attracted to you physically, amen, it, it excludes you. If we deal with um, Storgi, if you're not part of my blood family, especially my immediate family, then I exclude you. Amen. And, and to be honest with you, we don't even feel y'all, everybody. We only feel y'all, those in our community. Amen. Uh, that's why uh, you've got all these issues such as Black Lives Matter and the Proud Boys and Donald Trump. Amen. Because, amen, we don't understand agape love. Again, in agape, there are no gains. Agape is God-based. The other loves are game-based. Agape is a spiritual decision. The other loves are human emotion. Amen. God bless you. Uh, if you have any questions, again, you're free to text me, email me, uh, inbox me on Facebook, whatever, because I always try to make myself available to explain uh, what's going on. But love itself, I've spent 17 minutes talking about love. Love itself is a, is a, is a whole lesson. Uh, love itself uh, can take days to explain uh, to help us understand, but again, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fine tune. We're gonna hone in here. A love that never fails. We're in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verses one through thirteen. Again, these notes are on my Facebook page and on the New Salem Facebook page. Uh, and again, this lesson will remain online uh, on Facebook on both pages, and it will be on YouTube uh, approximately, approximately thirty minutes after we conclude. And so we're in the book of thirteen, uh, chapter First Corinthians is called the love chapter when paul stops to break down this thing called love and so now what look what he says uh after he has gone through uh helping them understand gifts and things they're doing uh he starts this chapter out saying this he says oh i speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. Now notice he says, though I speak with tongues of men and angels. Got that? Which means they're not the same. I'm going to take a moment here because tongue gets people in trouble. Though I speak with the tongues of men, not men, but men and angels mean they are not the same languages. Amen. Right? Tongues deal with human languages. We talk about speaking in tongues. And it is the most visible and coveted spiritual gift. As a matter of fact, many people uh, use it as the as the truest sign of being under the Holy Spirit because you're speaking in tongues. And since it puts people, it put people in awe. Uh, it was one of the covered gifts because we we like people to be stunned and shocked and speechless uh, at what we do. But again, tongues is not talking about babbling a language that's not understood. Because anytime you speak to anybody in a language that's understood, Amen. 
You're speaking babble. You're not helping anybody. Now, watch this. Praying is talking to God. Whatever language you use. Some people say spiritual, when you're speaking in tongues, you're talking directly to God. No, you do that by praying. Oh, I'm getting ready to explain this now. We're going to explain this. So if you're not talking to God, if you if you gobble and stuff, who are you talking to? You must be talking to yourself. And you find many people who are gobbling this, all this stuff they be doing, all in Kroger, all at the, at the driver's license station, all in the boat lines. Uh, they're just talking to themselves because they're not speaking in a language you understand. They're not speaking in a language that God's listening to. So it's garbage. We talk about tongues. We're talking about the tongues that were received at Pentecost. And those tongues were so that the apostles could speak in the native languages of all the people that were there. Did you get that? We're simply talking about a different language. Uh, Spanish, Greek, Hebrew, Roman, uh, the, the different languages. And it was so to demonstrate the universality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the love of God, because the gospel is for all, and God loves all men, because it is the will of God that all men might be saved. Amen, somebody. So when we speak of tongues, biblically, we're talking about speaking in another language. Amen. That's not automatically known. And that's what make it miraculous. That's what make it spiritual, because you're speaking in a tongue that you weren't accustomed to, that, that, that you really didn't know. And, and and what caused that? The Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit intercedes in your own mind, intercedes between your mind and your tongue. Amen, somebody. Or your heart and your tongue. It translates your you, the thoughts of your heart into a language that those in need can hear. Amen. Are you all with me? So now when we talk about speaking in tongues, we're not talking about babbling in the aisle. Uh, we're talking about speaking the word of God in a language that's beneficial to some hearer. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that it, that, that, that it's a sin to speak in tongues without an interpreter because you're not helping anybody. You're just trying to show somebody what you think you got. Amen. And again, uh, if nobody's in your church speaks Spanish, God ain't going to get you to speak Spanish because that's a waste of time. Amen, somebody. And so we're talking about the same tongues of giving it at Pentecost. Amen. To show universality of God's love. Amen. The universality of gospel. Now, speaking in another human language is a tongue. Then speaking in angelic language or heavenly language, amen, will be the highest order of that gift. Because it's a spiritual gift and angels are spiritual being. So he said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, amen, which means even if I have the highest order, if there's a such thing of, speak, of the gift of speaking in tongues. Amen. He said, no matter how high or divine I may think my gift may be, no matter how eloquent I may think my gift to be, no matter how awe-inspiring I may think my gift to be. And he said, if the gift is focused on me, to draw attention to me, then it becomes worthless noise in the ears of God. Worthless noise in the ears of God, which means it didn't originate from God. Did you get that? He said, if I have not charity, I am become as a tinkling symbol and a sounding brass. Now, if you think of a tinkling symbol and sounding brass, think of a child beating on a can, on a tin, not even a drum, just a tin can. After a while, it drives you crazy. And there's some folk who walk, go around speaking in tongues so much that it just drives you crazy. Go somebody. Now, he used the term charity. We think of charity as giving. Goodwill is a charity. Uh, people who give, uh, those are charities, right? But we're thinking of meeting, meeting certain specific needs. But charity in the biblical sense is love. Right? Because agape is love that gives. It spends itself on behalf of others. Amen. Again, agape is not an emotion. I told you it's a decision to do right. What well, a decision to do what? A decision to do. Do good. A decision to give yourself. Use your abilities, your skills, and your resources 
on behalf of somebody else. Amen. That's why the scripture says it's going to be hard for a rich man to get to heaven because a rich man has so much opportunity to agape that they don't. Amen. Agape is spent love that spends itself on behalf of others. Agape is not a saving love or storing up love. It is a spending love. I spend myself. And so regardless of how well you speak, preach, sing, or whatever you do in church, if you're doing it for folk to magnify you for your pat on the back, you might as well keep that to yourself because God does not hear it. He says, men are under me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Oh, you sound so good today, child. But you didn't have no spirit in you at all. Amen. He says, he says, and though I have the gift of all prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Now, as we read through this lesson, uh, when I say charity, you say love, okay? Because we're talking about charity in, the sense, in its broader sense, which is love, again, love that gives. Now, watch this. A lot of folk around here calling themselves prophets. It means the office of prophet no longer exists. Amen. That office no longer exists. Prophets could not pinpoint. Prophets could tell future events. No one said it's going to rain, but I don't know when. Amen. The prophets will tell you what God is going to do. And they, but they, and they tell you when he's going to do it. Amen. And very seldom do you see a prophet talking about somebody's personal business. Amen. Prophets speak in general and normally deal with nations. Amen. They don't come and they don't meet you in Kroger telling you you're going to get $10,000 in, 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 in the next year. Well, if you got a job, you probably will get $10,000 in next year. That's not prophecy. In, in, in that sense, preaching is prophecy because we know what's, what's going to happen. But, but we have a Bible that already tells us what's going to happen. So that office is no longer needed. But prophecy in, in, in this sense, but remember the New Testament is written in Old Testament times. And so prophecy foretells future events. Again, they see from mountaintop to mountaintop. They don't know how long or how deep the valleys are between. It's going to rain, but I don't know it's going to be, I don't know, I don't know how it's going to be 120 years before it rains. Amen. But watch this. Again, he takes the gift and he, he elevates it to the extreme. He says, now a prophet knows future events, but no one prophet knew all future events. That's why God had so many prophets. Now watch this. If all prophets knew all future events, God wouldn't have needed but one. That's why Jesus was the last. Amen. So watch this. So knowing all events in heaven and earth will be the highest order of prophecy. Are you with me? He takes the elevator. So he's not talking about, so he's talking to those who think they are superlative, that they are just the absolute best at what they do. And everybody wants to know who to go to as the greatest of all time. Greatest of all times and everything was Jesus. Amen. When you look for the greatest of all times in this earth, you look in the wrong place. Amen. Because the Bible says he searched earth. He could, but that was not a man found. So we need to stop looking for the greatest of all time in anything. The greatest of all time is Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, who was the greatest yesterday, today, tomorrow, and he will be the greatest ever. Well, amen. Somebody, that kind of stuff make you shout. So he's talking about the gift of prophecy. Amen. Now, again, God will put some people in your life at some point in time, periodically. Amen. To give you some inspired guidance. Amen. He will. Now, the office of prophet is no more. The gift of faith. What do you mean the gift of faith? <clears throat> we all have faith. That's called general faith. And saving faith is general faith. But the faith he's talking about is faith goes beyond. We're talking about the supernatural faith, the same faith that allowed Jesus to walk on water. Amen. The supernatural trust in God so deeply that you will speak to the mountain and the mountain will move. That's that grain of mustard seed faith. Amen. It, 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 it's faith that has so much power. It's like nitroglycerin. It doesn't take but a little bit to blow the mountain up. Amen. And you got that kind of faith. You can blow your problems up. You can blow your enemies up. Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 17, and Jesus said unto, unto them, because of your unbelief, 
But verily I say unto you, that if ye have the faith of a, of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto the mountain and remove hence yonder and place, and it shall remove and nothing, and nothing, and nothing shall be impossible for you. For we say by faith all things are possible. But we can't do it because our faith is wrapped up with some unbelief. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we have some unbelief in us. We have, there is an element of doubt. Amen. In all of our human faith, because we are human. We keep asking that what if question. Amen, somebody. But when you have absolute faith, this kind of faith, there is no what if. Because faith, your faith becomes your reality. Amen. And so watch this, what he's saying. Prophecy. Now, tongues is an outward gift. Prophesy was an outward gift. Faith is an inward gift, but it's manifested outwardly. These gifts at the highest level will impress people. But they fail to impress God unless they're motivated by love. And again, you, our gifts are not meant to impress anybody. They are meant to magnify God, to glorify him, and to edify the body of Christ. Amen. So the gift is never for the gifted. When God blesses you, that blessing is not for you. That blessing is for somebody else. God blesses you through others, and he blesses others through you. Hello, somebody. Give and it shall be give, given. He goes on to say, shall men sow in your bosom. God blesses through people. God moves through people. Are you still with me? Amen. So watch this. If whatever gift you think you got, if it's not in love of one you're exercising unto, then it ain't, it's nothing for God. I mean, it's meaningless. So a lot of the stuff that we do call ourselves serving God, call ourselves being holier than thou Christians, is just useless stuff. We're wasting our time. We're not impressing God. Amen, somebody. When, when you, I told you, give me pause. I'm giving you time to think. Because this is this this is more than talk. We need we need to start thinking about some things. Amen. That's why Paul told Timothy to study. Stop reading. Stop just reading to get caught in our words. But start start thinking about it. I see people singing songs in choirs, and they're singing the words, not thinking about. It. Now, when a choir is thinking about what they're singing, they'll sing they step to pieces. Amen. Somebody. But if they're just calling the words, they will look pretty and they'll sound pretty. But when you start thinking about that Jesus you singing about, start thinking about him like you singing, oh Lord, yo, it, it, it won't be anybody in the choir stand by the time the choir, the song in, and, and, and it won't be anybody in the pew. Because what comes from the heart reaches the heart. What comes from the lip reaches the ear. What comes from the heart reaches the heart. Y'all get that? What comes from the lip reaches the ear. What comes from the heart reaches the heart. He says, and though I bestow all my good. Now, 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 now keep noticing. I need you to notice this. Notice that each one of these verses are starting with a connective word. Conjunction and. Which means Paul said, I'm building all this stuff up in one person. And that one person still ain't going to be nothing. You got some people who can do so many things, but it's meaningless. It just look like they just run over with gifts. He made several gifts. They're not using to glorify God. So he says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Another spiritual gift is giving. Let me get me a sip of Coke while you, you think about that. Now, bless your heart. <laughs> Giving is a spiritual gift that nobody wants. <laughs> People ask all the time, I want to find out my spiritual gift. Well, most of the time, if their gift is given, they don't want to find it out. So it must be something else. It's like the rich ruler when Jesus says, all they have to give to the poor. He dropped his head and said, no, doc, I do everything else, but I don't want that gift. Now watch this. All of us Christians, out of our Christian duty, are called to give. We're called to be givers. 
a certain level. But the gift of giving is the one who gives freely and frequently far beyond the duty. You get that? They give freely and they give frequently. I mean, they're not trying to wait to the offering a, a tithe time. They're always giving. And they give far beyond what is called for, what is required. That's a gift. That's a spiritual gift of giving. Amen. Many don't have it. Most don't want it. But look what he says. The, oh, let's take it to the Again, he's taking the gift and take it to the ultimate. The ultimate thing you can give is your life. Great love has no man. This is a man laid out his life for his friend. So watch this. He says, even if you sacrifice your life, somebody, if you did it only to exalt yourself, you might as well kept living. Hmm. Some people will lay down their life to show how faithful they are. To demonstrate who they are or how well they're connected with God to make that sacrifice. That's what some people got into, some churches got into when, when this pandemic hit. They're going to say, well, I got to show faith in God. I, 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 we got to go to church. My faith in God. Now, God gave you some sense. Sanctification don't take away your common sense. We don't become, we become fools for Christ's sake in a spiritual sense, not in a human sense. You don't walk out in front of no bus because you say, I don't care how much oil you pulled on yourself this morning. That's why Jesus told Satan, I'm not going to cast myself down. Yes, the Bible said, but he said, Thou shalt not help the Lord thy God. But there are some folk who died from COVID. Trying to prove how holy they were, or how much faith they had. No, you don't prove your faith to me. You prove your faith to God by obeying His word. Amen. And so you don't. And, and, and so salvation does not take away your wisdom. Salvation is supposed to give you wisdom. And so He's saying the givers. He said, even if you're giving everything you got, even your life, to demonstrate who you are, He said. It amounts to nothing. It profit be nothing. What? You died for nothing. Because it didn't put a star in your crown and it didn't elevate your seat in heaven. Oh, somebody. I know it, 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 this, 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 this is some rough stuff, but we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine our motives to see why am I honestly doing what I'm doing? Am I trying to call attention to myself? Am I trying to make others look bad by making me look good? Am I trying to cover up some, some mess I did but yesterday for trying to look good today? What is my motive for doing what I'm doing? And so he even says, even laying down your life, that's an extreme gift. Amen. If it's done for the wrong reason, it profited nothing. And so look how he says love behaves itself. He says, love, charity, again, when I say charity, you say love, is long, it suffers long, and it is kind. First of all, love is an action. It's not a feeling. It's an action. Agape is an action. It's not about how you feel. It's about what you do, despite how you feel. All right? So agape love is stable. Because my feelings are unstable. That's why so many folk in church these days act funny sometimes. Because they're not living in agape love. They're living in one of the emotional loves. And so watch, it's not an action. Love is an action we're talking about. It's not a feeling. It is a chosen behavior, a choice that reveals your true devotion to Christ. Amen. You, again, you begin to live a life and make choices and steps that reveal your devotion, not to you, but your devotion to Christ, which a lot of times lead to sacrifice and suffering. But suffering here is not talking about pain. 
He's talking about patience. You, 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 you with me? See, my arthritis don't make me holy. <laughs> your migraine did not get you a star in your crown. Just because you caught the flu don't mean you're going to heaven. Suffering is not about pain. It's about patience. Can you endure? Watch this. What is he saying? He says love is not quick to quit. Get that? Love is not quick to quit. Some folk quit, quit so quick. As soon as they don't get their way, they quit. I just go home. No, well, you were there for the wrong reason in the first place. And you ought to be glad some of them folk left. Hello, somebody. You ought to be glad some folk walked out your life. You ought to be glad some folk left your church. Not in the sense of salvation. Hoping they'll find an, another church. But bottom line, and find Christ. But the reality of it is, you ought to be, when, when, when some folk walk with me, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you. They walked away before anything went down, anything jumped off. Amen. If you look at your life, there's some folk in your life you glad gone, and there's some folk in your life still there you wish would leave. But guess what? You don't want them away because love is patient. It's long-suffering. It's not quick. Quit. Amen. That's why marriage is in so much now, because they're too quick to quit. The first time you don't buy me a birthday card, I'm in divorce court. Uh-huh. Love never becomes vindictive or retaliatory. Love don't try to get back at nobody. And you see people all the time who say they're holy, but they're trying to get back at somebody. And most of them real slick about it. You got some slick folk in church. I promise you, you want to see some slick folk. Some slick folk in church. But again, I'm not I'm not saying just church. They're everywhere. But those in church that have to be extra slick because they're trying to hide. They try to get people to do their dirty work. Amen. It, it never becomes, and, and let me just say this. Even if you use somebody to throw the rock for you, Christ still counts the rock against you. Get that? Even though you use somebody to throw the rock for you, Christ still counts the rock to your hand. Amen, somebody. Look, look, look here at, at, at B. He said, Love envieth not. Now, he, we got to break down envy and jealousy. Envy is always a bad thing. Jealousy is sometimes a bad thing, but envy is always a bad thing. But jealousy, in the spiritual sense, is a desire to protect a committed relationship like God protects our relationship. Why do people get jealous? Because they have a fear that their relationship is being jeopardized by something. Okay? And jealousy will kick in to protect the relationship. So jealousy does not seek, really, is not really seeking to harm the person who is jeopardizing, even though it will kill, get you killed. It's really designed to protect the relationship. Are you getting this? So the focus of jealousy is protecting the relationship, which is what God does. In Exodus 34, 34, 14, he says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous, the jealous God. So I tell my wife, thou should date no other man. Thou should love no other man. Because I, whose name is a husband, am a jealous husband. That don't mean I'm I'm checking her. I'm going through her phone. That don't mean I'm I'm checking her voicemail. Nothing like that. That's 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 craziness. But if I find somebody trying to hit on my wife, I'm gonna move in the direction to stop that hit. Are you are you all here with me? Are you all here with me? And watch this. That's what God does to protect us. He ain't just looking to hurt nobody. But he's looking to protect his relationship. His relationship with us because we're committed to him. And so love is not envy. And jealousy desires to protect the relationship. Envy desires to get what somebody's got. 
Yeah, are you with me? Envy is envy is looking at somebody wanting what they got. And so envy leads to anger, to hatred. It leads to stealing stuff from folk. It leads from trying to injure people. Because envy is cut co envy covets. That means you I, I'm looking at what you got and I want it. In, 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 in the law, Exodus 2017, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Uh. And so watch this. He said, love envy is not. Which means when I see you get something, I'm going to say, thank God you got it. Because I know if he did it for you, he'll do it for me. That is nothing that God would do for you that he won't do for me. Amen, somebody. So why should I be jealous of what you got? I go get it myself. I take what you got. Because what God has for me, it is for me. Can't nobody else buy it. Can't nobody else wear it. It won't fit anybody but me. My blessing is for me. You see, he says, love vaunted not itself and is not puffed up. Mm. You cannot break this down without you getting mad. He said, love don't come to church like most church members come. I don't, I, I, well, I can't say most, how a lot of church members come. They come in the new cars puffed up. All uh, armor tie shining, car shining, car smelling good. They puff on the park lot. Want to hear about the city new car? They come in the church puffed up, strutting the gators. You got the, you got the, the Brahma and, and all these other horses, all these other kind of persons hung over the shoulder. You got gold, jewelry, and silver everywhere. Banging so loud you can't even see them. They got that Denzel Washington strut. Amen. Because they came in to be seen. That's called puffed up. Every time, and when you come in, they go, <laughs> it ain't nothing. Uh-huh. That's puffed up. Love does not brag because brag is in bragging comes out of pride. Love understands that every gift is important. Why? Because God gave it. And every gift has the same purpose, to edify the body of Christ and to magnify God. Every gift came from the same Holy Spirit. And spiritual gifts originate in love and they terminate in love. If your gift originates in pride and ends in pride, then it's not a spiritual gift. Look what Proverbs 16, 5 says, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Are you with me? If you're proud in your heart, you're not pleasing God with that singing, or that preaching, and praying. You are an abomination to God. God saying, Lord, I wish you heard me, heard me get through singing. You heard me get through preaching. You heard me get through praying. Because you're just making a fool out of yourself before me. Wow. Love is never... Never puffed up. Five. Love does not behave itself unseemingly, uncomely. You got to guard your mouth. Watch what you say and watch how you say it. Watch what you do. We're supposed to keep ourselves covered and unspotted before the world. So love never acts uncomely. And love will never lead you to do things that bring shame on Christ, shame on the church, or shame on yourself. All of us have done things that we were ashamed of later. Amen. But if we're operating agape, it never allows us to do that. Love not behave itself unseemly. Love seeketh not her own. Which means love is never selfish. But it acts on the best behalf. Look at my notes. I said the 
best behalf of the others. Love want the others to have the best. If you love your neighbor as yourself, if you want the best, you want your neighbor to have the best. But we have a tendency to give our neighbor the stuff we don't want. We go in our cabinets and we give the food bank old can. Give them some new can. Or go buy some can and take it straight to the food bank. Give them some new clothes. Amen. If the clothes are too old for you to wear, and you love your neighbor as yourself, they're too old for your neighbor to wear. Oh. Love acts on the best behalf of others. See, not on. Guess what? Love doesn't give to get a compliment. Love doesn't give to be told thanks. Love gives the thanks of giving comes from seeing the person you gave to move up or climb up. Love, finally, is not easily provoked. I think it's no evil. Watch this. Love has no temper. If love even has a temper, it's not hot-tempered. Because one of the fruit of the spirit is temperance. So love just don't get mad. There are some folks who get mad at anything. Anything set them off. Taking time bombs. Maybe if if, if 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 you mad because I didn't speak to you, then you were really mad because of something else. You mad before you saw me. Did that sink in? If you mad because I didn't speak to you, I just saw you. You were mad before I saw you. And you just focusing your anger on that, just using that to justify how you feel. Some baby, some else had you mad. Uh huh. Also, love harbors no resentments. You got some folk mad at you for something that happened. I don't know what is the resentment. A resentment is to refill anger, to rethink anger. Now go back and look at all the folk you mad at and ask yourself, how long have I been mad about this? If it's more than a day, something wrong because the Bible said, "Let not let the sun go down on your wrath." Love will help you empty your anger basket at the end of every day. And then, why? How does it do that? It does it by forgiving. Because love genuinely forgives. There are some people we said we forgive, we don't forgive. We still harboring that stuff. You, gonna, I'm going to get them back. I'm going I'm to get you back. Yeah, you think I don't forget. I'm going to get you, Joker. But love forgives genuinely. And, and, and so love... Genuine forgiveness does not release the person, it releases you. I just said something then. Genuine forgiveness does not free the person, genuine forgiveness frees you. Matthew 6, when he teaches me how to pray, he said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Let me mess you up real quick. I need you to pause. Not right now, but when you got when, when, when we when, when this lesson is over. And go back and think about understand to yourself. Everything in your life that has happened that you haven't forgiven folk for. And then what you've compiled is a short list of things that God is holding against you. Did you get that? When you compile your total list of all things you have not understood and forgiven of people, then you have compiled a short list of things that God is holding against you. Oh my goodness. And I wonder if you got enough people and enough ink. Verse 6. Verse 6, verse 6. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Oh, you got some folk who just love mess. Again, in church, the pastor can be preaching. And once the mess jump off, folk will lead the sermon to hear the mess. And they just so happy into it. They will sleep during the sermon, but when the fight starts, they wide awake. Love don't rejoice in stuff like that. Love does not rejoice in the face of others. You got some folk waiting on you to fall so they can laugh. I told you so. That's not love. 
because love desires to see others successful and make good choices. If you spend your life waiting to see other folk fall, you will spend your life never climbing. Mm. If you spend your life waiting to see other folk fall, then you will spend your life never climbing. Look what Paul says in Romans 1. In verse 28, he says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. In other words, you won't, you're going to keep bypassing the message to get a mess. So God going to give you over to your mess. But he says, this is the kind of person that really angers God, verse 32. He says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you got some folk who do mess and love to make other folk messy. They just love mess. And so they're always trying to get something started. And let me tell you how I had to identify these folk. The first part of the conversation would start with like this. Well, you know they say. Well, I heard. Uh-huh. Never I said, or I was part of. But well, you know they say. Never identify who they are. Uh-huh. Okay. Verse seven. Verse seven. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. All right? What does it mean to bear something? That means a whole abundant pressure. That means you can't put enough pressure on love to break it. Amen. If it's real love, all the way to the cross, be thy faithful unto death. Amen. Love does not fold under pressure. Love not made out of tin. Love is made out of steel and re made out of rebar concrete. Made out of steel. It does not cave under pressure. All right. Then he goes on to say this. He says it bleeds all things, hope all things. Well, love don't make you no fool. It does not make you naive. It does not make you stupid. Some in relationship will want you to be. But love says, no, I see the real deal. But I'm going to be positive no matter what. I see it's a bad situation, but I'm still going to be positive. I'm not going to stop doing right watching other folk do wrong. And I'm not going to become sour because you sin. I won't become sour because of your sin. Because you can't have control of me. So I'm going to remain positive. That's what love does no matter what. I'm going to keep hoping the best for you. I'm going to try to keep praying you through it. All right? And love endure. Love sees the real enemy. Jesus looked past Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. So love sees the real enemy and seeks to aid Satan's victims to help them overcome Satan's grasp. So when Jesus rebuked Peter, he, he rebuked Satan. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He was looking at Peter, but saying, Satan, get out of Peter, because I want Peter in my grasp and not yours. So he said, we don't give up. We keep on striving. We keep on trying. Let us be not weary and well-doing, but in due season, you should reap what you think not. So don't get tired of doing right. Don't give up, because God never gave up on you. There's some folks who said you weren't going to make it. There's some folks who said you weren't going to be nothing. But by the grace of God, he brought you through. So don't the next person deserve the same thing? Don't get love. On, uh, uh, love love is it, 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 not a cheap, cheap watch. Don't stop ticking. Love takes a licking to keep on ticking. But it's not foolish now. Don't get it wrong. Now, Paul oh, gives a summation. And I, 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 I love the summation. I'm going to try to run through because I'm at 59 minutes already. 
He says, love never fail. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. He said, so, he said, so stop praising the temporal things. Stop praising eternal things. Did you get that? Love transcends and outlasts all of the spiritual gifts. Why? Because when you become a spiritual being, you won't need spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are necessary because we're humans. But when you become a spiritual being, it's not a spiritual gift. It's part of your nature. Oh, somebody. Did you get it? So when corrupt well, becomes when, when corruption put on incorruption, mortality puts on immortality. We will change the twinkling of an eye. Amen. We'll no more physical or spiritual. You won't need spiritual gifts. Amen, somebody. But we will always need love, even in heaven. Because heaven is about love. So watch this. Love transcends and outlasts. All the spiritual gifts. He says, so if you want to, if you want to cover the gift, of it love. Learn how to love folk like Christ loved them. Number nine, he says, when well, we know in part, we prophesy in part, our knowledge of God is limited. The Bible does not tell the whole story. There are, there are other books that are not open. Prophecy only gives us partial knowledge because pro prophecy comes about a particular thing. But he said, a wise man is the one who knows no matter how I prophesy, no matter how I read my Bible, there's still more to know about God. That's why the Holy Spirit can reveal something new each time you read the same scripture if you read it for illumination. He says, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is impartial is done away with. He's saying perfection means nothing lacking. It's perfect. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. And so when the perfect model comes out, the previous version become obsolete. When the new and improved come out, the old goes away. Now watch this. The first thing that came was the Old Testament. When Christ came into the world, his birth, he fulfilled the Old Testament. Then he instituted the New Testament. The second coming, he will fulfill the New Testament. At that point in time, the Bible will become obsolete. Wow. Think about that. Become obsolete. It will be fulfilled. Because when we become glorified, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. Justified, saved from the penalty of sin, get you into the Bible. Sanctified being being saved from the Bible sin gets you through the Bible. Glorified being moved from the presence of sin gets you past the Bible. See the other books. Watch this. Matthew 5 17. He said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law and the prophets. That's the Old Testament. I'm not come to destroy, it, but to fulfill. Okay, the book to fulfill. In Psalm 40, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me was the Old Testament. In Revelation 5, 5, and one of the elders said unto me, we not behold the line of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus, the root of David, that's Jesus, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The book with the seven seals, amen, will replace the Bible. Amen. The Bible is a guide to guide us through this world. Amen. Unto a new life. He said, verse 11, he says, so we're growing. We grew from Old Testament to New Testament, the Lamb Book of Life. We're growing. He said, let me look back at this another way. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I thought I was understood as a child. I thought as a child. And when I became man, I could wait challenge things. It's amazing how many grown folk still act childish, especially in church. We cry about everything. Those of us who are supposed to be saved, we're always whining about something. Children operate at a limited and mental physical ability. There are people in, in church who act like children because they're limited in their ability in the word of God. On the word of God, never come to Sunday school, never come to Bible study. Been in church all their life and have never darkened a Bible study door. 
they're going to be limited. They're going to be a whiners and complainers. But adults operate out of greater faculty and greater facility. What am I talking about? Your faculty is your thinking, your mental ability. Your facility is your physical ability. You can do more and you understand more. Paul says in Hebrews 5, he says, for one time, you ought to be teach. You ought to be grown. But you have need one teach you again. It was first principle, the oracles of Christ. So in other words, he said, you're stuck. You're still a child. But you have need of milk and not strong meat. You don't want no meat sermon. You want a milk sermon. Something's going to stroke you and put you to sleep. And that's why so many people get sleepy in church. Because when babies suck milk, they go to sleep. Oh, somebody. He said, but everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of their reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You stop the word of God sanctifies you and make you stop acting foolish. It'll grow you up. And in verse 12, he says this. He says, for now we see through the glass darkly. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then I know even as I am known. Old days they had metal mirrors. The metal mirrors could not cast a clear image. Then they came with glass mirrors, but they only show a reflection. Likewise, our gifts are not complete. They're only representation of God's character and ability. You get that? Don't representation. When you see a reflection, yourself reflecting the mirror, that's not the whole you. The mirror can't show you your front side and back side. It only shows you the part you're facing. So it's incomplete. Now, gifts represent incomplete representations of God's character and ability. He, Paul says, but Lord, I'm waiting to see the real so that I can be known of him and he of me. First John 3, 2 says, beloved, we are now sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll see him for real. Amen. Verse 13. Now, again now, presently, abide faith, hope, and charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. Faith, hope, and love. He says, presently, right now, in this day and age, we have three abiding verses. Let me explain these real quickly and I'll go away. Abiding virtues are not spiritual gifts. Abiding virtues which means they are resident in you all the time and they are always present. So no matter when, who, what, when, where, how, why, I got to have faith. And I've got to have hope. Are you with me? But spiritual gifts are only manifested as needed according to the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? They're only manifested as needed. There are some medicines it says take every so-and-so, so-and-so. Some medicines say take as needed. Spiritual gifts are only active as needed as demonstrated by the Holy Spirit. Which again, the Holy Spirit would allow you to exercise your spiritual gift if there's someone in need. But it's not at your command. Oh, let me say this. The Holy Spirit Commands spiritual gifts, not you. The Holy Spirit commands spiritual gifts, not you. Are you with me? But abiding virtues are there all the time. One abiding virtue is faith. Faith establishes your relationship with an unseen Christ. Now, faith is something, thing, hope, for evidence, thing not seen. Hope sustains that relationship. Faith starts a relationship. Hope sustains a relationship that faith started. Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. However, when Christ has come back, faith and hope will become obsolete because you don't have to have faith or hope for what you've already got. Romans 8, 24 says, for we are saved by hope. But hope is seen, not hope. For what a man sees, why does he hope for? it? But the hope for him coming because you got him. He says, so hope and faith will perish. He says, but love will never cease. Even in heaven, we need love. And as such, it is the greatest of these three. 
Why is it great as he said? Because John 3 16 says, For God's love of the world, whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his son. Romans 5 says this God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to come. God commended his love while we yet sinners, Christ died. We were justified. More being now justified by his blood, we're becoming sanctified. We shall be saved. Amen. We shall be justified. Amen. Love. Perfect love. Perfect love is love that never fails. I hope I've been a blessing to you in some shape, form, or fashion. Again, this is Reverend J.W. Smith, Pastor New Zealand Missionary Baptist Church, 186 Hawkins Mill Road uh, in the Fraser community, located near Fraser and Open Crossing. We invite you to join us by our worship services Sunday at 11 o'clock. If you can't join us live, we ask you that you would stream with us on Facebook at 11 o'clock uh, and on YouTube by 7.30. Again, these lessons are always available, the Bible study on Thursday at noon, Facebook, uh, and it will be on YouTube at about 1.30. May the Lord bless you and keep you real good. Remember, in all things, love.